everyone. You are listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast presented by Great Railing. I am Jordan Hall, and as always, I am joined by the dynamic Joe Fordyce. Joe, the Flyers season is underway. We've got our initial glimpses of these 2021-22 Flyers. They lost their season opener to the Canucks in a pretty crazy game, a 5-4 shootout loss. And then they come back and they really pounded the Kraken 6-1 on Monday night. So they are 1-0-1 through the first two games. They have two more games on this season opening four-game homestand. Joe, your initial impressions of these Flyers so far, did you take more away from the Kraken win or did you take more away from the loss to the Canucks? Um, I, I would say I, I took more away from uh, from the third period and overtime and the Kraken win. Okay. So if we could add in the end of that first game. Um, what I liked was um, the team has a different look when, um, particularly when facing adversity late in that game uh, in the in the season opener, um, they didn't wilt. Now they did that a number of times last year, but this had a different look about it. And I'm not sure I can pinpoint exactly what that is, but I will say after Carter Hart had a a, a really rough second period, a, a second period that quite honestly all of us probably had flashbacks the last season. Uh, he, he rebounded nicely. He was forced to make a number of stops in that overtime. And that is something I felt like wouldn't have happened last season, um, for sure. Uh, what, you know, the negative from that was that had that feel in the middle of that season opening game that, you know, Last year when Carter would let in a goal, you'd blink your eyes and it would be four goals. And that's what happened the other night. But then he, you know, he really rebounded to, in that overtime to make those big stops. Now, of course, they lost in the shootout, but, um, you know, as, or as A.V. puts a call, they lost the skills competition, how he always puts it that way. Um, but then to see them come out and, um, I mean, I, I know it's an expansion team and, and all of that, but but, you know, expansion teams in hockey don't, you know, it, it doesn't mean the same thing as it does in baseball or, you know, um, certainly uh, football. Uh, it, they're, they're more competitive. I mean, you look at the names on that team, you know, Everly, McCann, Tanev, Mark Giordano. I mean, it's not like they don't have players on that team. And they have two formidable goaltenders. Um, so, I mean, quite frankly, both of the goaltenders Seattle has I think the Flyers would have signed up for either guy last year um, with the way Carter was playing, you know? So, um, you know, I, I, I was impressed and, ha- and how they kept the pedal down. You know, it didn't get to a, a, a three nothing lead and they just kind of sat back. They didn't do any of that. And that, that to me was another thing I felt like was a problem last season was get out to a lead and then sit there on it. And then, you know, you have, big blown leads and, you know, things like that. So uh, I, I, I would say I am impressed, but cautiously impressed, if that's a term, uh, that's how I would put it. Um, and, and I say cautiously because that, that second period the other night, it, it, you know, it's going to take, it's going to take a few games to get that one out of my uh, uh, memory, let's say, um, because, you know, that, Again, that looked like, take the names off the back of the jerseys, that could have been, you know, any game last season, that second period. That's very fair. Uh, Four goals in that second period against the Canucks, four penalties in that second period against the Canucks. Um, Winning teams, teams that contend for the playoffs, simply don't uh, commit four penalties and allow four goals in a second period. Uh, That just doesn't happen, and you don't win many games like that. To the Flyers' credit, they didn't quit on the game, and they actually stole a point out of it. Um, That's why I think a lot of people on the Flyers' roster came away okay with how that game finished uh, because they looked pretty much dead in the water 4-2 in the waning moments of the third period, and they somehow got a point. They'll take that. But And, Jordan, one other thing I'll say about that was not only did Carter Hart rebound in the overtime, which I felt like wouldn't have happened last year, But if you look at his post-game availability, and I'm not one of these people that gets totally wrapped up in this kind of stuff, but last year after some bad games, Carter 
in in his post game availabilities, he he'd be slumped down and looked very dejected. And I got none of that sense from his uh, post game the other night. And his coach clearly, um, from what we've heard from the first two games, he's all in with Carter. And you know, as, as Scott Hartnell and Al Morgani pointed out on the first couple of post games, that is not something we heard last season. Um, and, and in these first two games, AV has been quick to, uh, to compliment Carter and how he's played. Um, and, you know, last night, if not for, you know, I mean, he's, he's close to a shutout. Now he didn't have a ton of work. I mean, this is particularly the second and third period. I mean, at one point, I think in both periods, we were looking around at each other in the newsroom saying, does Seattle have a shot on goal in this period? Yeah. You know, it was very, very dominated by the Flyers. So, um, but still, one, get one goal allowed, regardless of the amount of shots he faced, you know, it's still one goal allowed. He got tested last night, and of course, he made that unbelievable save on Jordan Everly in the first period. Um, so, you know, I, I really think that what we've seen out of Carter out of the last four, well, say that late in the third, the overtime and, and the three periods last night, you know, it's really an encouraging sign if you're looking for a guy who has turned the corner from last season, I'll say. That save on Eberle uh, in the 6-1 Kraken win, that reminded me of 2019-20, not just from Carter Hart, but what the Flyers got a lot throughout that season was timely saves in the first period, and those really go a long way. And I feel like the Flyers got those a lot from Carter Hart and Brian Elliott, it allowed them to find their footing. And then a lot of times they, they came on strong. Um, that was huge. Uh, and that really reminded me of 2019, 20 and a good sign I took away from the Canucks game going into the Kraken game was that last year you saw a lot of ugly trends become re recurring themes. Um, if something happened badly in one game, it tended to leak into the next and the following against the Canucks, they have an awful second period after a really strong start. And they come out with all the, you know, the, those cliches of we didn't play 16 minutes. And it was true. They didn't, they hardly played half a game against the Kraken. They have a really strong start in the first period. They go up three, nothing. And they follow it up with a really, really good second period. It, you know, they didn't, they didn't fall flat or fall asleep or commit silly penalties. They, they came out with a really strong second period. And what happened? They pieced together a dominant performance. Truly dominant. 6-1. Uh, they controlled all three periods. They were physical. They stood up for each other when they had to. As we know, that game, tensions really boiled. Um, so just all across the board, they didn't allow an ugly trend in the first game leak into the next. I feel like we saw that constantly last season. It's why the season really went off the, went off the rails. Whereas... I thought that was a good sign. And Joe, really, to me, in that cracking game, what stood out a ton was that a lot of the new faces, new acquisitions were really driving that game forward um, across the board. Some, even some of the guys that really weren't even the touted acquisitions of the offseason. I mean, look at Nick Sealer, depth defenseman that no one really knew about. He comes out, drops the gloves with Jamie Oleksiak, gets the crowd fired up. Definitely didn't win that fight, but still stood up for his team uh, Jamie Alexiak wanted the fight. He wanted to stand up for one of his teammates. Sealer said, let's go. Got the crowd into it. And he finishes the plus three. Had a real nice steady game. Nate Thompson, same thing. Fights uh, Nathan Bastion. Uh, really pounded him. Stood up for Claude Drew. Those two got into it earlier in the game. Uh, Nate Thompson is in a new face, but he was an offseason acquisition, as we know. Did good things. Cam Atkinson, very strong. Derek Broussard, three-point game. Uh, Ryan Ellis has been great through two games. Keith Yandel has been solid. He had an assist last night, a really nice one. So just so many new faces uh, are making big, big plays early in this season. And that's what really stood out to me. Like this team definitely looks different against the Kraken. Joe, did you, do, you, do you feel that way as well? Yeah. And, and also, you know, we talked about as we went into the season with their injury problems and how the depth was going to be challenged how the depth went from a strength to all of a sudden a challenge within a couple of weeks time due to the injuries that they sustained, you know, um, Kevin Hayes and so forth. And, you know, 
Derek Broussard has really jumped up at that second line center and answered the question, can the Flyers survive at the second line center while Kevin Hayes is out? Um, three, uh, three points last night, I believe. Um, and, you know, he, he seemingly was all over the place. He was doing all, chipping in in all different kinds of ways. I mean, you watch him talk after the games in between period, or I guess it was between uh, the second and third last night, I believe, on the telecast. And, I mean, the guy, look, he's just beaming. Like, it looks like he's totally embracing his role. And I think that that embracing the role vibe has taken this whole team over. And that's what you see. And I'm not a big fight guy, but, you know, in a game that's 5 nothing. There's always a chance that shenanigans are going to start. And we saw that start last night with Bastion and Giroux. And, you know, like you mentioned, Nate Thompson stands up for him later in the game. Nick Sealer takes, you know, or I guess for lack of a better term, takes one for the team uh, <laughs> against Jamie Alexiak, who, you know, I don't think anybody wants to, you know, anybody's looking to sign up for that at the beginning of a game. But, you know, I guess if you're – Put it this way. Nobody's going to forget Nick Sealer's name because of what he did last night. Yeah. And again, I'm not a big fight guy, but I do believe it has a role. Um, when you're trying to build team chemistry with a, a group of players that haven't been together for a while. So I think what went on last night from the goal scoring, the goaltending and teammates standing up for each other. I think that could go a long way in terms of the chemistry building that's necessary for a team that is, uh, you know, kind of newly, uh, the, the, they're still in the, I guess, the gelling process, you would say, because, you know, they played a pre few preseason games, which obviously everybody doesn't play. And now we're through two games of the regular season. And, you know, this is going to be an evolving process because you're going to have guys coming back into the lineup. So you want, you want to kind of lay the groundwork for chemistry so that guys are willing to play and, and buying in to playing up and down the lineup because Derek Broussard, you know, maybe they work Kevin Hayes in lower in the lineup when he first comes back, but eventually you would think Hayes and Broussard are going to, you know, Hayes is going to move up to the second line center. Broussard's going to drop down and, and, you know, you want guys to be okay with that. Although what you're seeing out of the second line um, you know, you can't just, you can't chalk it up to two games. I mean, that's three guys who haven't played together and they really look like they've played together for a long time, um, particularly last night. I share that sentiment about fights too. I'm not a huge fight guy. I often think momentum really swings when you score goals and prevent goals. Uh, teams that are better producing goals and preventing goals, I feel like that really swings momentum. But I do feel like there's a time and place for fights and I enjoyed it on Monday night. I thought the Flyers, those were timely fights in my, in my opinion. Jamie Alexiak is on the Seattle side of it. His team's down five, nothing. He wants to stand up for a teammate and Nick Sealer says, let's go. Uh, that was a good time to really answer the bell. Nick, that's part of Nick Sealer's role. He's a depth defenseman. That's probably going to have to do some, some grittier type of things like that. And then Nate Thompson standing up for Claude Drew. I think when your captain gets into it like that and he's jawing with the guy in the penalty box, um, after the, their second second period uh, skirmish, you got to stand up for your captain. Like that's where I want to see that, and it really does build chemistry. Claude Drew, the captain, the guy that's the face of the Flyers, is seeing two role guys, two depth guys, really have his back uh, in game two of the season, and that 100% builds chemistry. It brings the team together, and the Flyers. That's a huge aspect of these Flyers because they have seven new faces. You can even say they have nine when you include the two claimed forwards that will be joining the team soon. Uh, that's a lot of new faces. You need to build chemistry quickly because you want to get off to a positive start to this season. I feel like the Flyers definitely built chemistry. Uh, that might be one of the underlying themes of that 6-1 win is they built chemistry by having each other's backs. I thought that was a real positive. And you, you mentioned, you know, the guys that are going to be coming in. And, and what you want to have is when those guys do come in, you want to have a situation like, where they come in and, and, and the guys that, have been, that are there, they, they, like, they can say, this is what we do. You know, welcome to, you know, to be part of it. This is what we've already established. And this is what we're about. And, you know, 
this is how we play. You want that set, you know, the tone already set for that. And I, I, I think the Flyers have gone a long way in the first two games, particularly last night's game, in establishing just that. Flyers Talk is brought to you by Great Railing. Stop into Great Railing for the highest quality and lowest prices on all your railing, decking, and fencing needs. And Joe, these Flyers don't even have Rasmus Ristolainen yet. He has missed the first two games because of an upper body injury. Sounds like he's very close. And then, of course, they don't have Kevin Hayes, their second-line center, who has been skating. He's been rehabbing on the ice. Uh, but he will have to miss at least 10 games in 24 days after going on long-term injured reserve. So these Flyers aren't totally full yet, but I do really like the response in that cracking game. Uh, wasn't really impressed by the Canucks game. I liked the comeback. I thought the first period was good, but that whole second period really marred that game. But through two games, I think all in all, pretty solid start for the Flyers, and they have help on the way eventually uh, down the line here. Joe, I couldn't help but think as I was seeing these games unfold that the Flyers really could have that home ice advantage back. I don't think that's a small thing to look at. I don't think it's a cliche home ice advantage. Um, I think it's a real thing in hockey, and I think the Flyers fed off of that. And Elaine Vigneault even mentioned when we asked him about excitement about having fans back before the opener, and he said I, he, he thinks everyone was looking forward to normalcy, which – Amen to that. I'm sure everyone was. It felt normal seeing a packed house, cheering goals, cheering fights. Um, a lot things feel a lot normal, more normal compared to what everyone went through last season. But he also mentioned his home record in year one, 2019-20. It was the best in hockey. They were the best home team in hockey. They allowed the fewest goals against per game. They had the most wins, the most points. They were a dominant team at home, and that really started to become a theme as they started rolling down the stretch. When they played at home, you felt like they were going to win. Not only win, but sometimes by lopsided margins. I got a feeling over the first two games that they can have a home ice advantage in Philadelphia. It can be an intimidating place to play. I really think the Kraken felt that. Uh, it is an expansion team, so it's a new group going through a five-game road trip to open the season. So that can be pretty daunting. They were in the third, uh, the fourth game, excuse me, of that five-game road trip. So maybe the Kraken were a little tired. But I really felt like the Flyers fed off the crowd and you really saw a home ice advantage. I can't help but think that could be a really, really big positive for the Flyers this season. Yeah, and it's interesting, too. You, you had a lot of guys mentioning the, the noise in the building and how loud it was. And you had guys that have been here and guys that are new here. So you had everyone. Um, and, you know, it's, there's probably an adjustment factor to playing back in front of fans. And, you know, we – when Taryn and I were at media day, we asked a couple guys about that and they seemed to think they would have a quick adjustment to getting back in front of the fans. So I think that's part of it too. Um, but it, you know, in addition to the team having home ice advantage, if you remember Carter Hart had a serious home ice advantage. I mean, he was, he was really, really unstoppable at home. Um, so, you know, back the last season where there were fans, you know, he was really, really unstoppable. And um, he was a different goalie at home. And, you know, you'd hope that can carry over with adding in playing well on the road as well, because that, that particular year they had some problems on the road. So, um, but yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, I, I was out there, uh, I was out in the arena for um, the beginning of the, the season opener. And, you know, there, it was, it was very, very, the atmosphere was very, um, it, it was intense. And, you know, again, there's, I'm sure there's part of that where it's, you know, okay, we haven't had this in a long time. So it's a little bit of an adjustment to being in a building where, you know, it's full and the fans are, are, are into it and things like that. But, you know, it was, I, it could definitely be a factor and, um, you know, hopefully the flat for the flyers that continues. And I think oh, that's, that's going to be dictated by their play. Indeed. And let's not be naive to the fact that fans returning in full capacity means the Flyers are going to have tougher road games. Um, let's not be naive to that. And the Flyers in 2019-20 were not a great road team. They started getting better as the season went on and as they started playing better. Uh, but they still were not a great road team, but they were so dominant at home that uh, 
they turned out to be one of the better teams in the Metropolitan Division, one of the better teams in the NHL down the stretch. So they will have tougher road games, and it'll be very interesting to see how the Flyers fare once they finally hit the road and play in some environments. But I think yeah, really- I, mean, I mean, they get thrown right into it too, right? Like their first yeah. game in Edmonton, their first road game is at Edmonton next yeah. week. Yeah. So I mean, that's uh, that's the first road game, right? Yeah, the three the three Western Canada games, Edmonton, Vancouver, and Calgary. So I mean. Uh, those are not, you know, anytime they go, you go to a Canadian city, it, it, those fans are not messing around. No. Um, I know Calgary's probably expected to have a down year, but I know, you know, Edmonton has high hopes and you know, they're going to be fired up there. Yeah. Vancouver as well is always, in, uh, you know, that's not a place that you can just go in and expect to win regardless of the quality of their team. And I think Vancouver has a decent team. We saw them the other night. So um, that that's a that's kind of a, a jumping right into the fire type of road trip as your first three road games. And the, the Flyers didn't travel to this magnitude all of last season. And obviously they went a long stretch of not traveling like that from the pause to the bubble. Um, so they haven't traveled, you know, to, to Canada and these lengthy, long road trips, these far flights um, in a while. You know, a lot of last season, a lot of those trips were bus trips, train trips. Um, not many were flights, and if they were, they were short ones. So the Flyers will have to get used to traveling and finding their legs uh, the way they used, you know, they had to back before uh, COVID-19. So that will be a challenge too. But it was great to see the Wells Fargo Center packed. It was electric. It truly, truly was. If you were there, uh, you could feel the crowd. I mean, Claude Drew, when he tied the game against the Canucks to make it 4-4 late in the third period in the opener, he said that was one of the most exciting goals he's scored. And, I mean, the guy's been around. He's played in Philly a long time. He's played in the Stanley Cup final here. He's played in big games. And he called that one of the more exciting goals he's scored. Uh, I think that was probably a little bit because he hadn't felt that type of rush from the fans again. Uh, the fans probably really helped spearhead that comeback. If the fans aren't in the building, I don't know if they come back in that game. Truly, I don't. And then uh, in the cracking game, Travis Konechny said during those fights, the Nick Sealer fight, the Nate Thompson fight, he said that was probably the loudest he's heard the arena in a long time. And, you know, Travis Konechny's been here for a while now. He's played in playoff games here. Uh, and that was the loudest he's heard it in some time. So these guys are certainly soaking up feeling fans again. And uh, you can see what it does for the players. And you can see what it does for the fans. The fans are pretty – they've been pretty rowdy. Uh, they, were having, they, they were having some hack stall chants last night in the stands. Uh, they were yeah, there was a little a little bit extra in the crowd last night for that, right? Just a little bit. A smaller uh, yeah. crowd, a, a smaller crowd numbers wise, according to the listed attendance, uh, not by a lot, by a, maybe it looked like about two thousand or so. Um, but the crowd still felt just as electric as it was uh, for the opener, and I think a lot of that's just because fans are so pumped to be back. That's a good thing. Joe, I'll finish with this. Uh, what did you think of Dave Hashall returning to the Wells Fargo Center and and, and the job he'll do with the Kraken? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm going to borrow a little bit of a theory from Al Morgani it, that he, maybe he did things backwards, that maybe he should have been the assistant with Toronto before he came to Philadelphia, rather than taking the leap from college to the NHL, because the difference between college and NHL is, I think is so much different than the other sports. When you're talking about making the leap from college to pro. Um, maybe not baseball, with baseball aside, but definitely basketball and, and football, um, that maybe he needed to be an assistant before he was uh, a coach. And, and I'll say just even from his media availability yesterday morning, he seemed like a different guy. Yeah. Um, now, he didn't give much to the media, which is no different than when he was here, but just his demeanor, um, his confidence and his answers about his team when he was asked about his team. Uh, I felt like he sounded like a different guy and, you know, I think he'll be, I, I think he'll do well there. That's a, a, it's a, it's a new hockey market. And I'm not saying like he's a coach that's going to um, get a city going crazy about the product, but I think in Seattle, they have a fan, they have sports fans out there where they're, they don't need much of a reason to get rowdy. I mean, the Seattle Se- the Seahawks fans, we all like they know everyone knows they're the they're nicknamed the 12s and they put the 12 up on the space needle and the whole thing. And 
you know, Pete Carroll is their head coach and he's got a super personality and he's out there running around, throwing the football around at 70 plus years old with his players before the game. But I don't think the fans are rowdy because of Pete Carroll. They're rowdy because they love their team. And we saw down the stretch, even in baseball, the Seattle Mariners this past season were making a wild card run. The building was packed with those fans. And I think the fans just, the, the fans in Seattle are a fan base that doesn't need to be fired up by personalities and coaches and things like that. And, um, you know, basically you don't have to give them a reason. So maybe that's a good spot for Dave Haxtell because he's not the most personality driven guy. Um, and you know, that, quite frankly, in the sport of hockey, there's not a ton of guys that are super personality driven, but, um, I, I think he's been set up to succeed there. So if he's going to have success, I think it'll be there for sure. And he did seem like a different guy um, a little bit when we met with him uh, before the game. It was it was nice to see him smiling and being able to reflect on his time in Philly. And he was happy to see people, happy to be back. Um, he has some good memories here. Uh, two teams went to the playoffs. It's where his NHL head coaching career started. I mean, he's he has the third most games coached in Flyers history behind Shero and Keenan. So, um that's, you know, he's in decent company in that regard. So he had been here for a little while and it was good to be able to see him reflect a little bit, smile, see people. Uh, he shook a lot of the media members hands. He said, you know, I was able to say hello and good luck. Uh, it was good to see him in that regard. And uh, then he was back to business, very Dave Haxall like back to business, focusing on a game. And that was always kind of his way here. And that's why I think he is a decent fit for Seattle. And I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't be su terribly surprised if he does good things there. And I, I, I hope he does. Um, I think he's a good human being. And the reason I think he could do well there is because he was always like a preparation junkie, very serious competitor, always prepared. And those guys, I think, do well with expansion teams. It's all about keeping things together, at least being prepared. You might not have the most talent. Uh, you might not have the most cohesiveness uh, to start. But if, if you play hard and you're prepared, you give yourself a chance. And a lot of people have been saying through the Kraken's first three games, before they met the Flyers that on uh, Monday night, they were playing hard. They played together. Uh, all three of their games were one goal games. They obviously had a really good win in Nashville. They took Vegas to the limit um, and then lost the game in overtime to Columbus. So I think Dave Axel is going to have them playing hard and being prepared. And I think that's really half the battle probably with the expansion team. So it was good to see Dave Haxall and it was good to see him be able to re reflect on his time in Philadelphia. Um, I think he gets, a bad rap a lot of times from fans here. Uh, fans are allowed to feel the way they feel. But I think Dave Haxall has grown a lot too, from how he handled the media to how he handles his players. Um, he was a first-year coach in the NHL coming from college. I, I think guys just naturally grow at anything they do. Uh, any human being in any profession, you grow and evolve with time. I think Dave Haxall has certainly grown, and I think we saw that a lot on Monday throughout the day. Yeah, and anytime you're on a list with Fred Shiro and, and Mike Keenan, that's not a bad thing. No, and then some people will probably say, well, that's not a good sign that he was here that long. Some people maybe thought he should have gone sooner. I think it's more of a product that the Flyers have bounced around from coach to coach a lot. Yeah. They've kind of, oh, they've yeah. Kind of had a short leash with coaches. I mean, Dave Haxall was coach, coached here for parts of four years. I mean, that's not that – it's not that long. <laughs> like, parts of four seasons, um, that's, that's not like a massive long – or massive lengthy stay. Uh, we've seen coaches stay much, much longer. I mean, Elaine Vigneault is on a five-year contract right now. Um, some people think he'll play that out. So if he plays it out, uh, he'll, he'll be up there too very soon. Um, and he's a, he's a pretty impressive coach with a resume and a track record. So we'll see how things play out. But Joe, I will say this. I think that next matchup with Seattle, December 29th in Seattle, I think that could be pretty fun. Uh, yeah, that could be very interesting, <laughs> particularly about what, what what happened at last night with all the, with the rough stuff and, and, and Nate Thompson. And, um, you know, by that point, the flyers hopefully are a little more healthy. So I guess it wouldn't be a shoe in that Nate Thompson would be in the lineup, but something tells you he'll be in the lineup for that game. Yep. And so, I would certainly um, think uh, the flyers will enjoy Rasmus Ristolainen in the lineup for that game. Not that Rasmus yes. Ristolainen is this big, bad fighter, but he plays a physical brand. Uh, he told Taron in media day, he embraces that people hate him. Exactly. So, you know, that's the kind of guy you want in the lineup. Anytime there's any chance of being, uh, you know, having the, the, uh, 
type of shenanigans that went on last night, uh, anytime there's a chance of that going on in a game, you want a guy that embraces being hated in the lineup. 100%. So that will be fun. We'll have our eyes on that December 29th matchup. It will be on NBC Sports Philadelphia. It will be a late puck drop. It will be at 10 p.m. Eastern time. But, boy, I would say get your popcorn, get your coffee, get whatever you need to stay up and watch that because – Hey, a lot of people be off during the holidays, right? You can stay up late and watch that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Get a little eggnog maybe. Whatever whatever you do, uh, I think that game's going to be must, must-see must viewing in my opinion. Yeah. So it should be fun. But, Joe, this was fun. It was great chatting with you, great seeing you. I've really enjoyed pre- and post-game live. Joe is our pre- and post-game live producer. Fans, you can check out pre- and post-game live before just about every game. Um, it's been a treat to watch. Joe, thank you so much as always. A big thank you to Ben Berry, our podcast guru. And Flyers fans, as always, thank you for listening to the latest Flyers Talk podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, please rate and listen. And we cannot wait to talk to you next time.